Well, this is different. Hello and welcome to another episode of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver and uh, I don't have my usual set. Um, yeah, a lot's changed since I last saw you, uh, which I'll get to a little bit later. Um, but, uh, you know, until I have a new set figured out, figured we would enjoy this lovely outdoor space uh, while I enjoy sipping a beverage here and talking photography with you. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about today, but before we get into it, let me tell you what I'm enjoying. So this is a, uh, a margarita, actually, but it's no ordinary margarita. It's a very special margarita. I'm sure it has a name, uh, but I'm going to call it the, uh, the Orange County Margarita, and that's because of its very special ingredient. Like any margarita, it's tequila-based, and you don't need anything special there. I just use Jose Cuervo Silver. And uh, you start with two and a half ounces of uh, tequila. Top that off with another ounce of lime juice. And uh, don't get that dinky concentrate stuff with a thousand ingredients. Get straight lime juice. That should be the only ingredient. If you want to squeeze it yourself, more power to you. I'm going to get some uh, agave syrup. Put a little couple of dashes in there to taste. That'll sweeten it up a bit. And then uh, finally, we get to add our special ingredient which is two ounces of orange juice. But it's no ordinary orange juice. It's very special orange juice. It is Orange County orange juice from that tree right there. That's right, baby. Fresh squeezed orange juice from the tree in my backyard. Um, I know we're not all living in Orange County and we don't all have an orange tree. So uh, stuff you get at the grocery store will be fine. But um, it's basically uh, an orange juice margarita all those ingredients in a mixer, shake it up real good with some ice, and then pour it over rocks. Uh, if you want to get real fancy, go ahead and salt the rim, but uh, I, uh, I didn't do that today. Uh, it's delightful. Everybody loves a margarita. Come on. Uh, especially on an outdoor space like this. And uh, this margarita with fresh squeezed orange juice is, uh, is something special. Damn, that's juicy. Um, yeah, you can tell I'm pretty excited about this old orange tree here. And that's because this orange tree is planted in my brand new home. Well, it's not brand new. It was built in 1924, but uh, new to me. So uh, before we get into some photography talk, let's get into the news, starting with what the hell I'm talking about with this house. So um, my, wife and I, my wife and I <clears throat> bought our first house uh, at the end of last year. We, our move date was December 31st, so we ended off 2020 um, with a bang. We were lucky to find this place. Um, I love it. It's craftsman style. It's built in 1924. It's old timey, just like me. It's got a detached garage, detached office. It's, it's awesome. Um, you may have already heard about this, by the way. A couple weeks ago, I posted a video on YouTube, just a brief one, uh, giving you an update on some news and uh, where I've been. Um, I took the video down because, well, I got sick of people emailing me my address. Um, several people were quick to point out that, hey, I can find your address pretty quick. Uh, here it is. This is where you live, right? And um, I knew you were going to be able to find my address easy. I wasn't exactly trying to hide it. Um, and uh, everyone who sent me that was well-intentioned. I appreciate your concern, um, but I figured maybe I should take that video down. It doesn't need to live in posterity on YouTube, everyone knowing where I live. Um, but I'll recap some of the news I talked about in there, one of them being the brand new, brand new house for me. And uh, it's a lot of work, super exciting. Um, it's an old house, so it needs a lot of work done, and I'm, I love doing projects. I love working on a house, so it's perfect for me. Um, so very exciting times. Also crippling anxiety times as well, but uh, that's just because I'm not used to having a mortgage. Um, but anyway, that's the first bit of news. Second bit of news, uh, I've begun work on the large format photography online course. That's my next online course offering. Uh, I'll be talking about 4x5, 6x17, 8x10, everything, baby. Uh, mainly it's about using the view camera. And uh, I've started work on it. Uh, I think it's going really well. I think the field shoots are going to be great. The visual aids I've created, I think, really help to um, 
make the topics of tilts and shifts and all that kind of stuff a little easier to understand. So I'm excited to get that out there. Uh, it's going to take a while to make. These online courses that I make are a lot of work because I do everything. I make the curriculum, the visual aids, the, um, uh, you know, the editing, the videos. I, I do everything on it. So it's just, uh, it's just a lot of work. Um, ideally, I would keep momentum on it. I would just take two months off and finish it. But uh, Papa's got a mortgage now. So I need to go out and do photo shoots, and that keeps pulling me away from it. So anyone who's interested in that course, I appreciate your, appreciate your patience. It, it is coming. I'm hoping to have it out uh, within a few months. Um, but that's a uh, bit of news number two. Um, another interesting bit of news, uh, which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, there is a company in Canada um, called uh, Raveni Labs. And they make this great little light meter that plugs into a hot shoe of an old film camera. And it's a simple meter. It's just a spot meter and reads middle tone. Um, and it's a great device. But uh, Matt over at uh, Raveni Labs reached out to me. And he's coming out with a new light meter, launching on Kickstarter very soon. And um, I've actually worked with him to implement my metering technique, the precision method of manual metering, directly into the meter. So the meter actually has a precision method mode, which is freaking awesome. I'm super excited about it and uh, I can't wait to tell you guys more about it. But um, I'm going to be uh, putting out a little video uh, just doing a quick uh, summary of that and, and direct you on how you can uh, help support that. And uh, we're going to be offering some discounts for students in my course and uh, people who buy the meter can get a discount on my course. So um, lots of fun stuff coming down the, down the pike for that. Uh, so that's uh, Raveni Light Meters. Um, coming up soon. That's the news and the drink, but I know what you're here for. You want to talk photography, baby? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today is uh, photography. And um, we're going to be talking about Portra 400. We're going to be talking about keeping the creative juices flowing when you hit a slump. All sorts of stuff. Uh, this is all coming from the, uh, a Q&A that I put out on my Instagram quite a while back. I've done a, a couple of these now. I'm behind the glass with the glass. A bunch of people submitted questions and um, I will be answering those questions. So I've already done a few uh, on previous episodes, but, but let's, uh, let's jump into it. So first question. Um, Elvind Auckland asks, thoughts on pause versus neg film? That's code. I don't know what that means, pause, neg. Positive film versus negative film. So um, reversal film versus uh, print film. So positive film, also known as slides, uh, is um, properly called reversal film. And negative film is properly called print film. That's what most people are acquainted with. But uh, he wants to know my thoughts on a uh, pause versus neg film. So um, reversal film is really fun to shoot, I will say. Uh, I like the process of reversal film because um, there's a lot at stake. You really can't alter the image after it's been taken for one, so you, your technique has to be good, and I, I, and I like that challenge. Um, your exposure's gotta be perfect, and I like that challenge. Um, and the narrower dynamic range of it can look really cool. Uh, the deep, inky shadows and the, the bright highlights, I think it's a good look. Um, but ultimately, I don't find myself using uh, reversal film very much anymore. And that's largely because reversal film has a very punchy, colorful, high contrast look, and that's just not what I've been gravitating towards uh, in recent years. I like the softer look, the softer color palette, the wider dynamic range of print film. Print film, you have so much more flexibility in being a little bit sloppy with your, uh, your metering, which I'm generally not sloppy with my metering, so I don't do it for that, but um, it is a lot easier to use, so I think that's what uh, makes it so much more popular. Um, but I think anyone who shot reversal film is intimately acquainted with the magic of looking at a piece of reversal film on a light table. It's nothing like looking at a negative on a light table. Um, the colors seem to be just oozing off the film. Like it's, it's rich, it's saturated, it looks better than any scan you'll ever get. There's nothing like looking at a piece of reversal film on a light table. Uh, and certain reversal films just have an incredible look. You know, Velvia 50, for instance, iconic uh, with its high saturated colors and really narrow dynamic range. Um, I, I guess what it boils down to for me is um, reversal film looks 
too digital, digital to me. Um, it's punchy, it's colorful, it's super sharp. And a lot of the reason I shoot film is for the film look. And reversal film doesn't have the film look as much to me. Of course it's a film look because it is a film. But um, for that reason, I just don't find myself shooting a whole lot of reversal film. But every time I shoot it, I really enjoy shooting. It's so fun to shoot, and it's so fun to look at the results. It's just the actual look of the resulting photo doesn't jive with, um, with my style very much. Um, by the way, uh, re recently someone on Instagram uh, said to me, Kodak Ektar, which is a print film, Kodak Ektar, is slide film for people who don't want to deal with slide film. And that was honestly so funny, I didn't even laugh. Like, it's like, God damn, that's really funny. Like, that's such a true statement, it's ridiculous. Um, so Kodak Ektar, with its colorful look, is a lot like reversal film, but you don't have all the hassles of reversal film. You know, you don't have to get your exposure perfectly spot on. Um, you can change the color balance afterwards. It's not baked into the film. You know, reversal film is permanently daylight balanced, most of them anyway. So if you're shooting in the shade, you gotta correct that with filters. If you're shooting inside, you gotta correct that with filters, so on and so on. So there's hassles that come with reversal film um, that sometimes people don't wanna deal with. I like those hassles. I think they're fun challenges, but the actual look, uh, not really something I, I gravitate towards lately. That brings us to our next question. And hey, what a perfect segue. <laughs> It's almost like I've lined out these questions in order for a reason. Um, what makes Kodak Portra 400 so popular with the new wave of film photographers? And that's asked by Alex Merlola. Um, yeah, Kodak Portra 400 is kind of funny because uh, the manager at my local camera store, uh, Pro Photo Connection, John, he, he tells me that Kodak Portra 400 has become the Kleenex of film. So like people will say, Portra 400, like they're just saying, I want film. So I want some Portra, Portra 400. It's like synonymous with just, this is the film everybody shoots. Um, so it's become insanely popular. And uh, I think it's for very good reason. It's not unjustified. Um, and you know, the, the closest competitor to Portra 400 was Fuji Pro 400H, which just got discontinued. So Portra 400 is only gonna get more popular. And I got some thoughts on Pro 400H that I'll get to in just a sec. But Portra 400. Few things about it that are, are great. Portra scans really easily. Uh, it scans well. The color inversion is quite uh, simple, straightforward. I always get good colors with it. So that's one of the reasons I shoot Portra. ISO 400 instead of 160. So there's Portra 160 as well. But um, with 400, it's just easier for most photographers to use because you can shoot handheld, especially if you're doing medium format, you're gonna need faster shutter speeds to freeze your camera shake because the, the uh, focal lengths are longer, therefore you need faster shutter speeds. So that extra uh, ISO is beneficial in many scenarios. Um, it's fine grain, uh, beautiful colors. It's a nice soft color palette. It's very flexible when you scan. You can tweak the colors and tweak the color balance and the exposure pretty easily. Um, but another big benefit to the Portra line is that it comes in every format. So there's 35 millimeter, 120, and 4x5. I don't know if there's 8x10, there might be. But um, that's one of the main reasons I shoot it, is I know that I can get the same look on a variety of formats. Because I do 120 uh, on my 6x17, I do 120 on my RZ, I do 120 on my uh, TLR, but I also do large format, I do 4x5. So I want to be able to keep consistency across the colors. Um, and having it available in every format is really nice. Kodak Ektar is also available in other formats, as a few people pointed out to me. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a super colorful look. So it's not necessarily uh, what I gravitate towards. And it's not necessarily what a lot of people shoot film for. The uh, softer color palette, I think, is a lot of the reason people shoot film. So Portra 400, um, you know, popular for a reason, I think. Uh, and Pro 400H, so uh, very sad that it got discontinued. I hope they re-release it in a new formulation at some point, because I think the more films out there, the better. Competition is good for everybody. Um, and uh, with Pro 400H, I always preferred it for indoor photos. So like when I have been working on my um, Dead Inside series, which I'm photographing kind of abandoned uh, or shut down corporate offices, uh, often under fluorescent lighting, 
uh, the colors on Pro 400H were so much easier to scan. I don't know why, but I always had a harder time getting good color outdoors with Pro 400H. But as soon as I went indoors, it kicked the crap out of Kodak Portra. I don't really know why. I guess it does well under uh, fluorescent lighting uh, and artificial lighting better than uh, Portra does. But I tended to prefer Pro 400H uh, for those scenarios. So, um, you know, uh, Portra 400 is great film. I do like to have variety, though. I wish there were more films available in every format that I use. But uh, it's not to be. All right, next question comes from Carlos Beltran, which I consider a good friend. He's a great guy. Uh, he did the um, uh, little short documentary on why we love film, uh, which I was in along with, um, you know, Willem Verbeek and Matt Day. Uh, so uh, he's very passionate about film. Love me some Carlos Beltran. But he asks, uh, how do you keep your creative juices fresh? Juices, how appropriate. Orange juice, creative juices. It's like I picked it for a reason. Um, I've struggled with that throughout my entire photography life is, uh, trying to keep the creative juices fresh, trying to stay inspired. Um, I find myself getting into slumps frequently, uh, where I don't really have anything I want to shoot, um, or what I'm shooting. I feel like I'm not doing it very well and I'm not being very creative. Uh, so it can be quite a challenge for me personally. Um, I've learned that I can't really force it. Uh, there's not much I can do to force inspiration or to force creativity. I've found that the best thing I can do is just go about my life and not think about it as much as I can. Um, and what ends up happening is just in the course of driving around, for instance, running errands or going to photo shoots, I end up finding a subject that inspires me. Um, or I end up, uh, scouting a new location that uh, sparks an idea for a photo that, I, that never occurred to me before. And then as soon as I see that, as soon as I have that marked in my brain as something I want to photograph, you can't stop me at that point. The inspiration just, just pours out and the creative juices flow and it's, it's all very organic and easy and simple. Um, so I try and let it come naturally. I try and let it come organically. It takes patience, which I'm not good at. So like if, I, if I'm not feeling very creative and I want to be creative, I feel the need to go out and try and handle it, try and drum up some creativity. And um, that doesn't often work. Uh, just letting it come when it comes by going about my daily life is usually what makes it happen. Although I will say, uh, picking up a camera can sometimes be enough to spark that creative juice. So I really need to make an effort to just grab my cameras more often and just take them out and start shooting. Um, like even just taking this RZ out of the bag and I opened the viewfinder and looked at it and I brought it out just so you could, just so you'd know we're talking photography today. What a stupid reason to bring out the RZ. But just looking into the viewfinder into my backyard, I'm like, ooh, I gotta use this thing again. And it made me wanna shoot the orange tree and the shed and all this kind of stuff. So just looking into a viewfinder can spark my creative juices. Um, so I probably, that, that would probably be something more proactive I could do is just grab a camera that I haven't picked up in a while and just go out. And the fact that I like using the camera, I'll probably f start getting creative and I'll flow and I'll, I'll jive with my subject and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's one of the reasons I, I love having such a wide variety of cameras. You know, I got uh, a TLR 6x6, I got my RZ, I got my 6x17, I got my 4x5. So if I'm not feeling creative, I can just grab a camera um, that I haven't used in a while, and oftentimes that, that can just spark the, the creativity. I'm just really bad at remembering to do that. <laughs> I just get so caught up with life, going out and taking pictures for clients, um, you know, working on YouTube, working around the house now and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to force that sometimes, but it is what it is. You gotta do what you can. Um, so good question, thanks Carlos. Uh, next question, I suffer from gas. Any advice on tempering that devil on my shoulder to buy new gear? That comes from Joshua Grapher. Joshua Grapher. Um, I suffer from gas. Uh, yeah, you might. Um, I have a great GI specialist here in Orange County that you may want to um, connect up with. Get, oh, oh, all capitals, gas. Gear acquisition syndrome. Yes, I'm intimately acquainted. Um, 
yeah, that's a, that's a tough beast to tame, my friend. Uh, you want to buy a new camera? Once you get that itch, uh, it's hard to uh, tone it down until you scratch it. Um, I think for me, just time has gotten me over that a little bit. I've had it so many times where I buy a camera and I'm like, this is gonna, this is gonna revolutionize my game. I'm just gonna change the game for me, bro. And then I get the camera and it's like sitting on the shelf in a month. So you kind of realize that equipment isn't usually the answer. And then, um, I don't know, if I get the itch to buy something, I, I can kind of stop myself and be like, yeah, you're probably not gonna actually use that as much as you think. I've done that so many times with 35 millimeter rangefinders. I, I think I'm going to, you know, get a 35 millimeter and start shooting 35, but I know it's not gonna happen. So uh, I just have to tamp that gas down. I just gotta hold, hold that gas in. Just hold it in. That's my advice, ultimately. Um, what was your first film camera? Asked by Ali's Vintage Camera Alley. A Minolta XGM. Um, Love that camera. It's really cool. It's all mechanical. I uh, got it at a pawn shop, or better, more accurately, my parents bought it for me uh, at a pawn shop when I was with them. I don't know that anybody even knows what a pawn shop is out there. Um, so someone who had a Minolta XGM got in a rough spot. Maybe they got divorced or something and they needed money bad. Or maybe they, you know, needed to put it into their arm. So they uh, went and sold their XGM to a pawn shop. And then old little 13-year-old Nick came along and bought himself an XGM with his, with his daddy's money. Uh, so I started on 35 millimeter and I uh, love that camera. It served me for a while and then I ended up getting an a autofocus Minolta and then I eventually got a Minolta Maxim 7. I loved that camera. That was actually a really cool camera. Uh, I still think it's a cool camera. And then eventually switched over to Canon. Uh, and then way down the road, medium format and all that stuff. E. Fluti asks, how do you factor diffraction into your work when trying to maximize depth of field? Mm. That's an interesting question, a uh, very technical question. So let me first explain what diffraction is. Uh, basically, when you close the aperture down real tiny, uh, you get a, a much bigger depth of field, of course, because that's the whole point of closing the aperture down. But when it gets real small, you start to get something called diffraction, which is when the light is bending around such a, the, the edges of such a tiny opening, overall sharpness degrades. Um, so generally, you try to stay away from the narrowest apertures available. You know, if the lens can go to f64, you would never use f64 because the diffraction gets so bad that overall sharpness degrades too much to be worth the extra depth of field. So um, when I'm trying to get a large depth of field, um, I keep it pretty simple. You know, you can get very technical about this stuff and you want to go down that, that forum rabbit hole. <laughs> Good luck, pal. Um, if you just want to go onto a forum and ask, oh, what aperture does diffraction start to be a problem? Get ready for your computer to catch on fire when, with people responding, oh, actually? So um, I keep it simple. Don't necessarily take my advice as gospel. But uh, I basically just try and keep the aperture um, two stops away from the, the minimum. So in other words, if it can go to F64, I never go beyond 32 generally. Now it depends on, you got to be smart about this. This, is the, this happens all the time in photography. People say something and then it's like, it's taken as gospel. It's like, oh, never go two stops, uh, closer than two stops to your, to the end of your apertures. But you got to be smart about it. What would be worse for the photo? A shallower depth of field or overall degradation in sharpness? That's not always going to be the same answer. It depends on what you're shooting. Overall degra degradation to sharpness may not be that big of a problem. Like when I'm shooting for clients um, for my architectural work, oftentimes I know that the picture is never going to be printed bigger than 8x10 because it's going in into a little printed brochure that's not that big. I don't really worry about diffraction on those pictures because they're not really being printed big enough for diffraction to show up. But if I'm printing huge, yeah, I'm going to be careful about diffraction. So um, you, you want to be smart about it. Think of the end product. Think of the end result. How big is it going to be printed? How important is sharpness? How important is depth of field? Maybe the depth of field is more important. But um, the sharpest apertures are towards the middle, uh, you know, the middle apertures. So sharpness starts to fall off at the wide apertures and it starts to fall off at the narrow apertures. So just to play it safe, I try and stay two stops away from the narrowest aperture. And then I, I feel like I'm not getting into diffraction territory that's going to ruin the photo.
Um, but that's just me. That's just how I roll. Not necessarily the right way to do it. All right, uh, a couple more questions. What hair product do you use? I'm not even joking. That's by Tommy McGinnis. Um, thank you. I appreciate the question. That means you like my hair. Um, I use a product called, um, it's by Duke Cannon, and it's called um, like uh, News Anchor Pomade. That's what it is. Duke Cannon News Anchor Pomade. Uh, and I like it because it's water soluble. There's a lot of pomades out there that aren't water soluble, so it stays in your hair even after you take a shower. Um, but I found it's pretty good and it's not too smelly. I was using this product called Trace Flores for um, a long time, but it had a very strong scent to it. And as my barber liked to say, it makes you smell like your, uh, your girlfriend's ex-boyfriend, um, Trace Flores. But uh, I found a Duke Cannon pomade and, and I like it. Also top it off a little bit of hairspray if I'm being honest, but don't tell anybody. Um, all right, let's do a final one here. Uh, Andrea Maffe, or Andrea Maffe, I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Any advice for young photographers working in a saturated market? Um, yeah, it can be tough, man. There's a lot of photographers out there and you're competing with a lot of people. Um, I'm actually planning on putting out a video with kind of a list of advice I would give to someone who's trying to become a professional photographer, but um, I'll just give you a short one here. Um, outwork everybody and have no pride, I think are the best two bits of advice I can give you. Photographers can sometimes be so prideful where they're not willing to shoot something that's beneath them. You know, I was shooting an O'Reilly Auto Parts two hours ago in La Habra on a Saturday. Like, I have no pride about my photography because the bottom line is if you're trying to make a living with it, you need to treat it like a business. And sometimes in a business, you got to do things you don't want to do so that people will give you money. So um, don't be prideful. Shoot anything and everything in the beginning. And then as you go along, start to hone down your, your strongest skill. I found architectural photography was my strongest, but I, I did portraiture for a little bit. I've shot pets, I've shot products, I've done you know corporate headshots. I've done all sorts of stuff and I found what I was good at and I started working towards that. But you know, when you're starting out, you can't turn down jobs, man. You gotta take work. You're trying to build something, you're trying to make money. Take the jobs, don't be prideful about it. Um, be prideful about the fact that you're getting paid to use a camera. That's pretty freaking awesome. But there's a, you know, you could fill a stadium with all the photographers who are out of work now because they were too proud to shoot something that paid uh, because they, they thought it was gonna, you know, damage their reputation or they were above that or something like that. So, so don't have pride about it. Let other photographers be prideful and turn down the work and then um, they won't be working in a few years probably. Uh, you know, and going back to the outwork everyone thing, realize that, uh, you know, being a good photographer doesn't matter as much as working hard. You have to be reliable. You have to be on time. You have to over deliver and under promise, like just work hard. It's not that complicated. And I know it's hard to figure out how to get your name out there, but that's just a hard work thing. Contact places that might need your photography. Uh, pound the pavement, reach out to people, uh, wake up every morning and have a goal of, of sending an email to five different companies that might need your services. You know, it's just doing the hard work and eventually it catches and you don't have to work so hard anymore. You're just taking pictures and you're getting referrals and it's not that difficult. Um, so that's, uh, that's my very short bit of advice. But again, I'm going to do a video that's, uh, that's much longer. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's all we're going to do on the Q&A. Hopefully you guys found that somewhat useful. Um, sun's setting. It's getting to be dusk here. So I'm going to turn on all my string lights. That's one of the first projects I did uh, with my dad. My dad came over and we hung up a bunch of string lights because, uh, you know, I'm a white millennial. Of course I love string lights. So I got uh, probably way too many of them around here. But it creates a good vibe. All right. Go make yourself an Orange County Margarita. TM. Um, it's delicious. If you can't get yourself some fresh squeezed orange juice, just do the best with what you got. But I think you'll like it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, before we go, I just want to say one thing. Uh, big, big thank you to anyone who's sent me a contribution uh, on the channel here. Whether you're doing a monthly thing or you just a one-time thing, I can't tell you how much it warms my heart that uh, people are willing to send me a few shekels in exchange for videos like this. It is a huge help. It's a big motivation. Um, you know, I'm not immune to the effects that COVID has had on the economy. So every dollar helps and uh, I greatly appreciate it. If, uh, if you do want to contribute, just visit nickcarverphoto.com slash contribute. But either way, thanks for watching. Appreciate you guys. Cheers. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.